All right, folks, so as we get started, uh, I kind of want to set the tone on why we find ourselves here. A lot of folks are here because they want to know how to make compost. What is this composting stuff is all about? We certainly are here to answer those sort of questions. Uh, but also, I think uh, that composting is a part of a bigger picture, uh, bigger dynamics that are going on as well. And um, I was introduced to even more dynamics, even in the conversation since I've been here and out to dinner and a whole lot of other things as well. But before I get deeper into that, let me go ahead and look at our agenda. The first block up there is going to talk about yesterday. Today, uh, we'll get started here and. Uh, uh, Jean, a, a doctoral candidate, she will come up and continue her presentation and her work. I, 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 how did I do, Jean? I'm not going to finish. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, and also, Ben, anybody understand what the definition volunteer told is, right? So I was suggested that, uh, I said, Jean, come down and, and let us know what's going on internationally and, and nationally. Let us, let us know, let us uh, get a good sense of that as we in, uh, embark upon this venture of understanding composting. And she says, you know what, I can talk about it to a degree, but I'm not gonna come to Kentucky and, and talk about regs and all that sort of stuff. Uh, why don't we invite folks uh, from Kentucky to do that? So we'll hear from Jean as well and her work, but also we're gonna hear from Robin uh, Green and she's gonna come to us She's from the state office of EEC. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jean, uh, Ms. Green, what does that stand for? Good, good. I didn't mess that one up, so I had all kind of uh, words for those acronyms. But so we hear from uh, uh, Jean as well, and then uh, Dr. Lucas is going to come and share with us about soil science and soil health uh, right after lunch. Um, but again, your restrooms will be right outside. I think the, uh, to the left of the uh, elevator is the, the men's restroom, and to the right will be your women. And then at lunch, we are going to have uh, lunch provided. We're going to have pizza. So that will be in the same room and in the back of the room as well. Uh, we're not quite sure or sold on our agenda for tomorrow. Uh, we're going to make that call now, or we're going to wait later on. Uh, we're going to, so the agenda tomorrow is that we kind of finish up with our talks and, um, and maybe do a recap. Uh, well, I'll let Jean, Jean make that call later on and, uh, and go from there. So that's that. The, <clears throat> now let's talk about how we found ourselves here uh, at 36 degrees in December and the Kentucky State campus with all these great folks in this room. Um, March of last year, this year, uh, we had a field day on our property. And part of that field day, we had a hands-on exercise of putting up a fence, a woven fence and barbed wire and building a gate. I love gates, wooden gates. I, I used to put up metal gates and they, they stole them off my property so I converted to wood gates. So I wanted to share that, but in the midst of doing that, they had a demonstration on soil health or uh, the, the rainwater. Who's familiar with that demonstration? You know what I'm talking about? Yes. So that was, who's, who said yeah? Yeah, it's, it's illustrating runoff. The, the runoff and the effect of different types of um, composition of soil, soil composition, and how uh, water affects that soil. And I thought I was really doing something really uh, ingenious and industrious. And so prior to that, I went ahead and prepared my, my plots. One I plowed and one I tilled. But what happened is that I exposed my soil structure to the presenter for the whole world to see. And so what he did, he did the demonstration, and I got to see how a soil composition can be grossly impacted because of its composition, right? And then so what he did, so politely did, is that he went over to the soil and he said, for years ago, decades ago, the top soil was what? Six inches? 12 inches? Two feet? The top soil was 
huge years ago. But he pointed out to the top soul of my of just this. You guys catch that? And I was devastated. Because I already knew our property was in horrible condition. I, I, I knew it because uh, when we bought it, it was just full of broom sites. And I'll give you a five minute little video in a minute. But it was full of broom sites. And then we did soil testing and all this other things as well. And so I, I says, oh my God, we're going to be up against it. So I says, i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to amend it. I'm going to get a bunch of compost and, and I'm going to amend it. <laughs> And so after that, uh, my wife and I received our certification for, for 26, we, we managed 70 acres in Brackenridge County, Rolling Hills, beautiful Brackenridge County. And uh, we, just this year, we, our farm was uh, certified, 26 acres of the farm was certified organic. Thank you for that. It's a heck of a task, but at the same token, it also uh, told me that um, you got a task ahead of you. I'm going to be very, very limited on what we can and cannot do. And so, so then as a result of all those things coming together and understanding the task at hand, because now I know this soil firsthand is, is, is horrible. So what's on the agenda now? So now we got to understand how to develop, increase, SOM, soil organic matter. We got uh, we to gotta figure out a way to be able to deal and increase those, the moisture content with nutrients and valuables. I'm like, how are in the world are we going to do that? And so then we're looking out and looking at other options, mulch, you know, fertilizer, uh, acceptable fertilizers and other things. And we realized the cost for compost and the availability of compost in Kentucky is horrendous. And so as a result of that, uh, I fell across a research uh, on sustainability. Because folks, at the end of the day, my wife and I are looking at, you, you may know what a succession plan is. I hate to talk about succession. Who knows what a succession plan is? <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, succession, uh, Gina, are you doing any succession planning? Uh, okay, she refuses to. <laughs> okay, so now all of a sudden I find myself over in the area of the word sustainability. You see that? I like sustainability. So how can I, how can we sustain this current trajectory of farming? And so now we're talking about, well, our daughter or our children, we'd love for them to do that. And then uh, uh, to our surprise, we had one of the, the children to invest in farming and she, uh, or owning a farm, for, she bought, purchased uh, part of the 70 acres that we are talking about managing. And so now we're talking about sustainability. How can we sustain and do good and do better about this topsoil that I was talking about? This is why we have two inches, right? How can we do better? And so then we found this uh, Southern Sustainability, Agriculture, and, and Forestry uh, conversation. Anybody familiar with SAR? How many folks are familiar with SAR? It looks like the professors in the room. And the, yeah, so, so we found SAR, and, and I'll point to that in a little bit. And then we fell in love with SAR because SAR provided a structure, a framework to help make sense of this. And before I give you that, I want to show, show you a clip on our farm. It's about five minutes. I hope you don't kill me for doing that. But I hope it, it'll set the stage for what we're talking about. And I wish I would have done this yesterday. It would have been very helpful yesterday as well. Um, but before I do that, I want to tell a couple of stories. Anybody like any stories? He's oh, God. Uh, I want to tell a couple of stories. I got a friend that lives in um, Chicago. And he said he went to one of the most diverse, culturally diverse schools in Chicago. And he found himself as a young man on the high school basketball team. He said he never thought he would be able to play basketball, but he found himself on the basketball team. And he was pretty, he found himself, he was pretty good at it. 
But one of the t uh, members of the basketball team was a Puerto Rican. And they became friends for life. And they would visit each other, and he would often find himself visiting his uh, Puerto Rican friend and family and having dinner, right? And he met his Puerto Rican mother, who did not speak English. And she never uh, decided to learn how to speak English. And he says, as life progressed, he's, he's, uh, he's a um, career presenter, educator, uh, researcher, writer, author. And he says one of his regrets is that he never learned how to speak Puerto Rican. Is that the best? Y'all didn't catch that, did you? <laughs> uh, so he never uh, decided to speak another language. How about that? But his friend passed away. And at his funeral, he found himself alone with his friend's mother. And while he was standing next to his friend's mother, he started crying uncontrollable tears and crying. And he turned to his, his uh, friend's mother and said to her that, I love you. And then she responded in kind with the same word, I love you. So I like that story because they did not speak the same language, Puerto Rican and English, but they spoke to each other from the heart. The other thing I'd like to share too, how many folks know the story about the praying hands? Anybody, the artists who, who depicted the praying hands, anybody know this story? Can somebody look it up real quick, the praying hands on your phones, the Dr. Google? Charlie, you got it on your laptop? Do you have it, the praying hands? I think it's in Germany or something like that. When you find it, can somebody let me know if you have it and then tell me where, what's your, here's the thing that for, for the sake of uh, time. The praying hands is, is depicted in, I think in Germany, somebody tell me where it's at. Germany, okay, German. So what happened is he's very talented, but very poor family was faced with some crazy odds, right? So they had money to send one of the children to art school. So the one that was very talented uh, says, okay, to his other brother, won't you go? He says, no, you're talented, won't you go? But the one who did not get a chance to go to art school, uh, in their town, the, the business at hand, the business at hand was, no pun intended, the business in that community was coal mining. So then what happened is the brother that was left behind, he spent a lifetime in the coal mines. So the brother who went off to art school and came back, who became very successful at, at uh, art work, says, okay, it's your time. I'll go to the mines and then you go to school. And the brother says, no, my time has come and gone. And I'm an old man now and my hands right now could not do anything more than what it's doing now. So his brother then in turn with so much of passion and love says, okay, let me then in turn depict your suffering and your pain and your endurance by painting your hands. And so those of you, you may come to, may come to your consciousness that you have referenced those hands before. You may have seen them on the walls, uh, in your churches and other places, but that's the story behind them, that. And that story is a, is a story of love and passion. And so I come to you this morning as a stakeholder in this process of agriculture in this medium. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. And a lot of good people out here doing this good work. And so what we want to be able to do, we want to come to this arena and this field by having compassion and love for the process for the next man, the next woman, or for the next project, or, or the next concept. Uh, it's a lot of work that needs to be done. So I'll, start, I'll, I'll, I'll stop with that. And now I wanna draw your attention to my property, which is deficit in nutrients. Uh, and then after that, then I'll turn over the, the clicker to Ms. Green and she'll start with her presentation. And, and let's see what's going on here.
ready to feed my horses. You see my horses down there? They have about six acres in here. Sorry about that. You see them down there now? They have about six acres in here. And then they have an additional six acres that they like to have access to. house down there in the distance. I like to give them each a bale of hay a day. I hay that bale my the hay I bailed that hay this summer. about 400 bales. I'm not gonna use near that amount. I'll have plenty of bales of hay left.
little bit. And then there's Bali circling around. You can get a better picture of the uh, rest of the farm. You got the barn that we're working on, and there's a pond that's stocked, we stocked it. But, uh, two years ago. It's been built for about four years. The barn we're working on, the retreat center, which is the blue house, blue building you see there, is uh, finished on the outside, but we will start working on the inside here shortly. We have our, we have three ewes and two yet, two lambs that needs to be weaned inside our barn. So I hope you enjoy. Three to Research uh, that um, the outline for that for me, uh, and I think Dr. Lucas would agree, can, and actually, Gene, I think you would agree as well, can have set the context and, and the framework for the work that needs to be done around composting. Um, and, and so, uh, program objectives for uh, educational professional development grants and or research grants. Uh, we are looking at doing a research grant that will help uh, set up the parameters for Kentucky, uh, Jane, for composting. You know, what that looks like for Kentucky, the feedstock, grain, mass, that sort of stuff. So in addition to that, uh, the framework for that is product productive productivity, uh, stewardship, profitability, and the quality of life. So whatever we do, we want to have these things in, in mind when we're trying to put our mulching facility in place, uh, we're trying to do composting facilities, or if we're trying to do uh, uh, mixed produce, uh, uh, forestry, or if we're trying to do a uh, animal uh, farm or ranching, we want to have these things in mind, and which is very real. And the last one here, I'll draw our attention to that. Some of us uh, work full-time on the farm for part-time pay, and we do that for 20 years and not take time out for a quality of life and taking care of ourselves. So we want to take, be mindful of that. Whatever research, business plan, <coughs> I want to consider all of those things. Uh, some, some sustainability goals. It doesn't have to be all of these, but some of these. Uh, but uh, you, um, they start with marketing, and I've already been trained already, you've got to start with marketing. Whatever it is that you're doing, you've got to understand the market in which you're operating in. What does that mean? Where is your market? And then sometimes, folks, markets move. Moves? What does that mean? Well, watermelons may be uh, shipped in April or May to Michigan and then from Louisiana. So the Louisiana grower, when you get to June or July, he may not ship to Michigan. So the market moves. So understanding the variabilities of your markets and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, social resilience. Uh, let's see what else. E ecological uh, pest management. We want to make sure we uh, we can focus on that by itself. By itself, rotational grazing. Charlie, that's where we're at. That's that's why I wanted to show that field. How can I really take care of the health of my animals? And I have a pasture <coughs> that looks like that. I got to do much better than that. I can't afford to put water on it. You know, droughts happening. Let me say a full letter word, uh, um, climate, okay. or a six letter word, climate crisis. 
How about that? So we're in, so now our, our, our weather patterns are not uh, dependent, well, in their words, we never could be loud, and they could come in less and less reliable. So, so one of the big things on our farm is looking at rotational growing, putting fencing, fencing up and all that good stuff, and then so on and so forth. So um, let me get through this. Examples of that, nutrient management, compost. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Luke is going to talk a little bit more about this as well. Uh, recommended research designs. When we're talking about doing research or working with other folks on designs, uh, uh, Sarah. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I said up there when I was standing up that we have to be on the mic. So now this gives a little bit more flexibility to be down here with this hand mic. Thank you for that, Anthony. Uh, Southern uh, Sustainable Agriculture and Forestry uh, Education, or uh, their, their goal is about sustainability. Right now, if you're 20 or 30 years old and you're doing this farming work, what is your uh, sustainability plan? What is your farm is going to look like 30, 40, 50 years from now? There is a, I will hear tell from K Card from Marissa that was a cheese uh, producer doing great high end quality cheese, but there's no one to be able to maintain that in his retirement. So now we're losing all of that. So, um, so that's what SAR brings to the table, and it provides a structure for us to make sense of that. The uh, farmer, uh, you researchers, uh, you're in the room. Who's a researcher in the room? Make sure you call farmers before you write the grant. No. Be, okay, go ahead and write the grant, but don't send it out before you don't talk to us. <laughs> so farmers... Please, um, in your research designs, make sure that you include farmers. And Dr. Lucas repeatedly say this out loud to me. Uh, farmers know a lot more. They're a lot farther ahead of the game than most researchers are. They just have to get humble enough to acknowledge it. Oh, I love this because this is kind of the, uh, the framework for the work that we're doing here. Over in the middle of there, we have organic compost, or mulch is the core of all the work that we're trying, that the energy that I'm willing to put a few years into right about now. And you're talking about soil health, increased microbial activity, plant health and disease and pest control, and then um, organic compost on the inside of that, which will play a huge role in that process. So here's the part two of that structure. The first st structure is that we want to do science behind that and kind of understanding what that looks like on, at the university level. I'm sure um, Dr. Lucas has got a good sense of that, but uh, we want to know what it's like on our farms as well. We just don't want to take what uh, maybe Jean and her uh, doctoral candidate uh, dissertation, what she comes up with, right? But we also want to know what's going on in Kentucky. And so we want to do this part first, and so we, so we get some baselines frameworked on what's what's happening on our farms, in our region, in our state. And then we can uh, then put those practices in place on our farms and see what that's like, right? And then uh, here it comes to that pasture for me. Um, I see this, for, for my farm, the first thing, challenge that I would have to undertake or get over would be being able to Oh, crap. Um, being able to get that, um, that uh, soil health at a good place, and what I really wanted to say is that organic matter on that property, um, organic compost and nutrient, I have to get that on that property come hell or high water. And if not, um, then we're going to have to do... So if you don't do this the right way, then the next thing you're going to have to do is have money. And how many of us have the money? So I think that's, uh, uh, I think that's it this time. 